A man is walking down the beach and comes upon an old bottle. He picks it up and uncorks it, and out pops a genie, of course. The genie says, thank you very much. Now I grant you three wishes. The man is very excited. He said, I've always anticipated this moment, and I can tell you quickly what I want. He says, for my first wish, I would like to have a billion dollars in a Swiss bank account. Flash of light, and in the man's hand is a set of numbers to his new account in Switzerland. He says, number two, I would love to have a brand new red Ferrari right here. Flash of light right in front of him, brand new red Ferrari. And he said, for my third wish, I would like to be irresistible to women. Flash of light, and he turns into a box of chocolates. <laughs> Clearly, the man wasn't a good steward of the resources entrusted to him. Would you turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 16? It's uh, generally assumed that um, this is a parable of the unjust servant or steward. In actuality, the word parable is not used here, nor is it used a little later on, which we'll study in a few weeks down the road, on the rich man and Lazarus. So whether this is a fictional account, and in a sense a parable, which is just to give us simple truths, or whether it is a true story, it packs a powerful punch about how we are to manage our resources. By the way, what is the connection between the resources God gives to us and managing them and our spiritual resources? How did the two connect? We're going to see that as we work through the text together. Luke chapter 16 beginning in verse 1. And he also said to his disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that the man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. Then the steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I am ashamed to beg. I have resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? So he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another's man, uh, what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Let's talk to the author of scripture together. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you for the dual authorship that you had Luke penned this account, but as he was guided by the spirit of God. Father, your word is alive, and it is to instruct us today. It's as relevant as the day that it was written. 
So, Father, may we understand the applications that we might know what to employ in order to be pleasing to you. Open the eyes of your stewards today, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The previous story is called the parable of the prodigal son. And the word prodigal means to be wasteful or to squander. This story is the prodigal servant. He has not managed well the resources that were allocated to him to supervise. Now, in verse 1, Jesus begins the story by speaking directly to his disciples. There was a certain rich man who had a steward. Uh, you might want to let your eyes catch the word had. It's the imperfect tense verb, which means there's a continuous action in past time. In other words, this man probably for quite some time had been the steward. The word steward, very interesting word as well, from a compound Greek word, oikos, house, nemo, which means to allocate. It's to allocate household goods. Oftentimes in the first century, a steward was a slave born into a rich man's house. And he was trained how to take on that role. That doesn't seem to be the case here. This is an outsider. He would be more like a financial planner if you had to give a comparison with today. And an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. Wasting. Scattering is the word that is used here. The same verb appeared back in chapter 15 in verse 13, wasted. As the prodigal son wasted his father's possessions in that distant land, this steward has squandered what was given to him to manage for his master. The rich man now in verse 2 is called out for his action. What is this I hear about you? <laughs> Observe in the account, there's no defense given whatsoever. The man is caught red-handed with his hand in the cookie jar, and he knows it. The owner says, give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. Here's my question. What is the most important thing when you are a steward? Turn with me, first of all, to 1 Corinthians chapter 4 to get that answer. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and I'm going to throw one in it, no extra charge. It won't be on your PowerPoint, but it'll be over in Hebrew. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And by the way, as you're turning there, we are all stewards. Everything that you have is a gift of God. Paul makes the argument in chapter 4 and verse 7 of 1 Corinthians, what do you have that you haven't received? You can't tell me one thing that you have that belongs to you because of your own, if you will, initiative. Everything that you have is because God has put a heartbeat within you. Because God has given you a skill set. Because God has given you the energy to go to work and produce. Or God has given to you at the moment of your salvation a spiritual gift or spiritual gifts in order to serve the body of Christ that they might build. Whatever you have, whatever you have, if you're honest, has come from God. So Paul writes here in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1, let a man so consider. And by the way, that's a command. Paul is commanding the Corinthians to consider us. Who's us? Paul, Apollos, Cephas. As servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Today when people are asked, what do you do for a living? And some say, I'm a minister. As if that was a title that gives people the pause to go, oh, great you. When Paul identifies himself as a servant, that word later came to be used of an under rower. You watch any of the old movies? They imprison a slave, put him down at the bottom of the boat, and what do they do? Row, row, as somebody is whipping them and telling them that they need to produce at a certain beat. 
That's how Paul describes himself and his associates, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Listen, you know what has been entrusted to you? Things that were not known in Old Testament times. A mystery is a sacred secret. Once hid, but now revealed. The church of Jesus Christ was not known about in the Old Testament. To us has been given the mystery of understanding that one day the Jew and a Gentile would become one, one body in Jesus Christ. We have been given a tremendous stewardship of the mysteries of God. Now, verse 2 of 1 Corinthians 4. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found. Everybody give me the last word. Faithful. Faithful. Okay. You're a steward. There is one thing that God wants from you more than anything else. He wants you to be faithful. And you go, I can do that. Because it doesn't have to do with ability. It doesn't have to deal with a skill set. It doesn't deal with a great intellectual capacity. It's just very simply, what has God given you to do? Now be faithful in what he has entrusted to you. And you really need to be sitting down and you need to be asking yourself, how am I doing with my time? God gives us all the same investment, doesn't he, 24-7? How am I doing in my service? Am I diligent there? What has God entrusted me with? Would people look at me and defend me and say, I was faithful in what God has called me to do? You really need to sit down and think about your witnessing and how often you open your mouth for the Lord. Because the truth of the matter is that this world and this world system is winding down. And as it says in 1 John, that we don't love the world, either things in the world, or the love of the Father is not in us. For all that is in the world, lust of the flesh, and lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away. Moses, who would have conducted hundreds of thousands of funerals, so to speak, says in Psalm 90, so teach us to number our days that we might gain a heart full of wisdom. James would say, your life is but a vapor. You are here one moment and you're gone, poof. How well have you managed what God has entrusted to you? How well have you managed your money? Think about it. It's all a stewardship. And we're all going to give an account before the Lord. So since you are a steward, there is one thing that God wants from you, my friend, and that is for you to be faithful. How are you doing in your faithfulness to church attendance? How are you doing in faithfulness with your personal Bible study and prayer time? How are you doing in those things that God has entrusted to you? Are you one who is being faithful? Now turn with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3 one of the key words in the book of Hebrews is better. Because Christ is better than the angels. Christ is better than the Old Testament Aaronic priesthood. God, Christ is better than, and it goes on and on and on. So one of the words you would want to underline as you're studying the book of Hebrews is better. And over in chapter 3, pick it up in verse 1, we're going to have someone that was renowned, the man Moses. How renowned was he? Well, think about it. God supernaturally protected him shortly after he was born. Mom and sister put him in a little ark, right? That little box, put him down the Nile River, discovered there by Pharaoh's daughter, a supernatural protection. Later on, it would be the same man that would walk through the parted Red Sea and lead a nation. He would be the same one that would be given the law. He's the same man that when it was time for him to be buried, wasn't like everybody else. In Deuteronomy 34, it says God buried him. His body was so important that the devil is having a discussion with Michael the archangel about that body, we read in the book of Jude. So it's not an ordinary individual, but he most certainly was a faithful man. Now, in chapter 3, verse 1, therefore... Holy brethren, speaking to the saved part of the church here, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle. Jesus was sent as Moses was sent. Moses to lead the nation of Israel, Jesus Christ 
to save the world. Notice this, consider, and that's a command, the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was, and give me the next word, everyone, faithful, faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was, give me the word, faithful, faithful in all his house. For this one, speaking of Christ, has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. And it's an interesting transition, by the way, here to verse 4. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. Now, I thought you were just talking about Jesus in the previous verse. How can you transition over to God? Well, Jesus is God. And Jesus was instrumental in creation, as we read in John 1, and then also in the same book in chapter 1 in the earlier verses. So we just see here about who Jesus Christ is and why he's greater than Moses. But both were faithful. Verse 5. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant. For a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. You see, Moses was a type of Christ. In Deuteronomy 18.15 and Deuteronomy 18.18, the scripture says that God was going to raise up someone in the future like Moses, a deliverer of the people. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, but in verse 6, but Christ, as a son over his own, uh, over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing in the hope firm to the end. So now turn back with me, please, to Luke 16. But I want you to truly let your minds engage in the whole topic of stewardship and faithfulness and then start to evaluate your own life as we are doing this. Now, the steward had cooked the books, which provided a good life for him, but it also made him soft. Because notice here, he ponders in verse 3, what shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I am ashamed to beg. So desiring the finer things in life, he has a eureka, I found it, moment. Verse 4, I have resolved what to do. That when I am put out of the stewardship, he knew he was getting canned. He knew he was getting the pink slip. They may receive me into their houses. He concocted a plan so that when he got put out by his master, the other people who owed his master would take him into their houses. He is a slick dude. He's figured out how to be cared for. And down in verse 5, he summons all of his master's creditors to him, and then he says, how much do you owe my master? Notice his initiative, verse 6. And the first one said, a hundred measures of oil. And you're going, I'm not really sure what that is in the commodities market today. I know I paid a buck 59 when I was at Sam Club last week for gas, but what is a hundred measures of oil? A measure is from the Greek word batas. It was just over eight gallons. The debt is about 875 gallons of olive oil, valued at 1,000 denarii. I don't know if that's helpful to you, but let me put it in this term. That means about three years of labor by the average working man to pay this debt. We're looking at a lot of money. So in the second half of verse 6, so he said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Did he discount the price? Did he remove the interest? Did he take off his commission? I I'm not sure how he did this, but one thing is clear. He is endearing himself <laughs> because he's really cut a lot of money off of the price of the creditor. Then he turns to the second, verse 7, and how much do you owe? So he said, 100 measures of wheat. Now, a measure is from the Greek word karas. Uh, Kor is a Jewish measure for grain, flour, etc., and equals 10 to 12 bushels. So 100 measures would cover about 100 acres, a debt between 2,500 and 3,000 denarii. Break it down in years, 8 to 10 years of labor for the average working person. 
And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. Hmm. The former person got a 50% discount. This person only gets a 20% discount. We're not really sure why. Maybe it dealt with the kind of commodity. We're not sure. But then the master doesn't praise the steward for being dishonest. Notice what he does is he praises him for his shrewdness. So when you're dealing with a parable, which most likely this is, you're looking for the central truth or truths that, are, that is to be communicated. Verse 8, so the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. And then Jesus makes this assessment, and, and I hope you really sit up and take note of this. This is such an insult to us who are saved, who have the Spirit of God. This is such an insult to us who have the book of Proverbs. This is such an insult to us who have the entirety of the word of God from Genesis to Revelation. And you have the unsaved out there without the spirit of God on the means to go to hell. And notice what Jesus says for the sons of this world, the unsaved are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light, the Christians. Jesus points out that those without an eternal perspective are more prudent with their assets than the saved. And can I tell you something? After 2,000 years, things haven't changed. I often watch... The unsaved manage their money better. I often see the unsaved who set aside monies for their kids' college. I often see the unsaved who provide so much better than many of the Christians I know. And it makes you scratch your head and go, what's up with that? We've got the totality of scriptures. We can see the account even in the Old Testament like Joseph. He comes into Egypt. And Pharaoh had the dream about the famine, but the, plant, the years of plenty at first. So what does Joseph do? He sets aside in the years of plenty. But no, not in America today. You make 50000 you spend 60000 You make 100000 you spend 120000 It doesn't matter. We just live for today. We lack wisdom. We haven't picked up what the scriptures teach. We haven't learned even from the little ant in Proverbs 6 that understands that winter is coming. So he gathers up supplies in the summertime to be ready. It's such a correction. It's such a correction that it should make us take note. And now we're going to have three employment points or three applications that Jesus gives to us. I love when he gives us the application. And he does. In verse 9, let me read this to you. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. When you fail, in other words, take your money, use it to reach the lost. So when you fail, when you die and go to heaven, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. In other words, some of those folks are going to beat you to heaven because you've taken your money and you've built a relationship with the waiter or waitress. You've taken your money and somehow you've built a relationship with neighbors, co-workers, whatever. You've been generous in some way, shape, or form. The world can see we're different than everyone else. It gives us the means to use that money to lead people to Christ. And as a result of that, one day we die and guess who the heaven's greeters are? Those individuals that we have been used to lead to Christ. Isn't that exciting? And I see Christians, and I, and I hear it all the time on Sundays. I know waiter and waitresses, they don't like to work on Sunday because the Christians are the cheapskates. They're the ones who come up to them afterwards and says, let me give you a tip, you know, plant corn early next year. And people get tired of all of that. And when I see Christians, sometimes, and, and I've talked to Christians, I remember talking to a particular gentleman. He was having somebody do some electrical work for him, and I said, pay him generously. 
And this other person who wasn't a Christian came in and said, well, I'll, I'll do it for you for free. And, and my Christian person I know says, well, look at the blessing I got. And I thought, you just missed an opportunity to be generous. You just missed an opportunity to show the overflow of the generosity of believers because God loves generous Christians. Use your money. Build relationships. You know, it's my privilege to write books, but I pay for every one that I distribute. I'm not one of these famous writers, and, you know, they give me a 1,000 books and say distribute it. $15 per pop. My Revelation 1 is coming out. I'm already praying, Lord, give me some money. Why? So I can buy copies. So when I come upon people and I build a relationship with them, and I, I can tell you the people right now I'm praying for their salvation. Why? I gave them a book. It cost me something so that they can read the book. And if they get, you know, 20 hours where they're in the Scripture and learning the Word of God, the Spirit of God, that's a lot of time. You know, you get a track. It lasts, what, 30 seconds? Spirit of God might do something, may not. It all depends, but you plant a seed, and that's the right thing to do. Oh, but to give somebody a book or to buy somebody something of Christian value like a Bible, you get the idea, and you give it to that person, and all of a sudden they're telling you they're reading it. And they're giving you reports about, well, I didn't know that, or this is new to me. And you can just sense the Spirit of God working, but it costs you something. But imagine that person coming to Christ. Imagine when your time is up and you're transported into the presence of the Lord and that person is there to greet you. Now, is that a good use of your money? It's so much better than what I see Christians spend their money on. They're out at Joe's Crab Shack when they can't afford it. And it's a regular thing to be eating high on the hog. And, you know, what used to be a special occasion for Christians where we would go out occasionally and have a nice meal has become an everyday fare for a lot of people I know. And it's a shame. Because they've worshipped themselves and idolized themselves and pampered themselves more than ever doing anything for God. And God says, those folks, Christianity is shallow. So I'm encouraging you. And here's point number one. Let me give it to you in this way. Invest in the lost for them to become heaven's greeters. Let me say that again. Invest in the lost for them to become heaven's greeters. I've seen people come to church through generosity with tips. I've seen people have a Christian witness because of just being generous in your outreach. And you folks, you need to be thinking this through. How can I use the resources God has given to me in order to lead ones who don't know Christ to Christ so that they can greet me one day if they get to heaven before I do? Something to think about. Our second point, let me give that to you. Faithfully invest your money to accrue spiritual dividends. Faithfully invest your money to accrue spiritual dividends. Let me read verses 10 through 12, and I'll explain this to you. He who is faithful in what is least, by the way, that's for money, that's least, is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true Riches. And if you have not been faithful in what is another man, see, because we're all stewards, who will give you what is your own? What I would say to you is this establish a budget. Give to God first. And for those of you getting older, finish strong. If you've done well all your lives, don't go into the retirement mentality that I'm just going to cruise until I'm in the Lord's presence. You make sure you're faithful right up to the end. God has always been faithful to you. You treat him the same way. Two passages I'd like to share with you. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Turn there, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 16.
Pick it up in verse 1. 1 Corinthians 16 in verse 1. You'll find the, the two uh, English words now concerning is a para de construction, which there's a new topic being introduced. Paul uses it throughout 1 Corinthians to do this. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, he writes, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you, and notice the next two words, must do also. Must do is a command. In the same way that I have given commands, said Paul, to the churches of Galatia, you must do this also. What is it? Verse 2. On the first day of the week, that would be the day of worship, that's our Sunday, let each one of you, does you, everybody see each one of you? And you know what each one of you means in the Greek? It means each one of you. You know, I've known people that, you know, the husband makes a lot of money and the wife makes money, and the husband looks at the wife and says, well, you know, we'll just tithe off of my money. Well, doesn't she get to lay up treasures in heaven too? Because everything else is just temporal. I, I'm just telling you, it, it really doesn't matter what you have. The trophies fall apart. The degrees, the letters start to fall off. The houses and the properties one day, according to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, are going to be torched. This world and this universe as we know it are going to be burned up. So what is remaining? That's what you need to think about. You need to have an investment plan, yes, for retirement. But you need to be thinking out 100 years. You need to be thinking out 1,000 years. You need to be thinking out 10,000 years. Because those investments are sure where the others are not. On the first day of the week, let each of you, and here's the command, lay, tithe me. And the verb is used here as an imperative. Lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. So are you trying to figure out how little do I give or how much? Look at your income the last five years. Has it gone up, gone down? How about your offering? You know, some people, it just stays the same all the time. I'm telling you, one of the joys of getting a raise is you can give more. Because it is the way that you lay up treasures in heaven. Second passage I'd like you to see is Galatians chapter 6. Not far away, over to the book of Galatians. And see, I love the imperatives, the commands and scriptures, because he's speaking to churches. So at this point, what one is told to do, all are told to do. Isn't that what it says in Revelation to the seven churches? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says, not just to the church, but to the churches. And in Galatians chapter 6, and I've always said this, you know, I was sick only the second time in 25 years two weeks ago. Our check was written out. The Lord got that money anyhow. It's not mine. When I get a paycheck, the first thing I do is we sit down and we write out our check to the church because it's really to Christ, period. That has never been compromised because I wouldn't have anything if God didn't give me a paycheck. And I don't redefine the word tithe. You know, a tithe of some people means how little can I give off of this? And you know what? Take a good look at your life and see what you have and what's been taken away from you. And maybe you can figure this plan of sowing and reaping and you can see why you have what you have. Or why you don't have that. Or why there's no joy or peace in your life. You know what? When you rob God, don't think anything's going to go well for you. In Malachi chapter 3, the question is asked, will a man rob God? And the response is, yeah, you've robbed me in tithes and offerings. And then later on it says that, you know, if you rob me, I'm not going to rebuke the devourer. In other words, your crops are going to be consumed and everything's going to go wrong. Do you really think you can rob God and he's going to give you abundance of peace and joy? Do you really think you can rob God and everything is just going to go fine? Now listen to me. Just because you give to God and give faithfully doesn't oblige God to bless your entire life. But I'd rather have an insurance policy with God than I would with State Farm. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 6, let him who is taught the word, that's the congregation, and see the word share, that's from koinonia, it's another command. And by the way, it's a present command, which means keep on doing this. Keep on sharing in all good things with him who teaches. The connection is this. Paul uses the analogy in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 about the ox that treads out the grain. 
You don't, you don't, if you will, muzzle the ox. Why? Because as it's treading out the grain, it should be able to eat along the way. And see, I'm just sharing this with you because this is just a biblical truth. What you get here and how you get fed spiritually is greater than anything else you get in life anywhere. You can go to the finest restaurant when you leave here, and if your priorities are right spiritually, you know you've always been fed the best when it comes to the Word of God. Because this is what's eternal. This is what is lasting. These are the things that God would have us to hold on to. Where that one meal that you're going to have, it's going to come and go, but the Word of God is eternal. Don't ever forget that. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Now, don't miss the connection, everybody, because the very next verse is in the context of meeting the needs of the spiritual leaders. Do not be deceived. The present command can have the meaning of stop being deceived. The word deceived is from planao. It's the word where we get planet, which means to cause, to wander. Don't allow yourselves to be deceived. That's what it's saying here. And you know this comes up often in Scripture. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good morals. Do not be deceived. It comes up and up and up and up. Why? Because as Christians, we can be led astray too into error. So do not be deceived. God is not mocked. The word mock means to turn up the nose at. You can't turn up your nose at God and get away with it. God is not mocked. And here is the timeless principle. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. And I've shared personal stories with you. God does so much more than we can ever give to him. If you were to take 100% of your income and somehow have the ability to give it all to God, he still would do so much more than what you've ever given back to him. And see, he doesn't need your money. He owns the cattle on a thousand hill. He can provide for me. He could have, you know, any billionaire or millionaire walk up to me on any day of the week, and I could lead that person to Christ, and that person could say, well, I'll take care of your needs. He just allows the church of Jesus Christ to take care of their pastors so that they can lay up treasures in heaven in order that God can just bless you because this is all a faith journey. And if I give to God first then it is a faith journey that at the end of the week, I'm still going to have everything that I need to take care of me. Do we walk by faith or do we walk by sight? That has always been the issue here. So don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, that shall we also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And you know, some of you get back your returns at this time of year, you know, the receipts is what I want to say, from even churches, and how much you gave. When you sit down and look at your income for the year, and then you look at how much you gave, is that something God is pleased with? Or is that something you need to reevaluate? And I just want to share this from the bottom of my loving pastor's heart. This isn't for me. This is for you. <laughs> I've seen how God can take care of me in miraculous ways. I never fret over the next paycheck. I never worry about those things because God promises that if I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, he's going to take care of me. And you know what? I'm telling you, he always has. I've never worried about that. And if there's ever a church, and this is what churches do, you know, when they don't like their pastor, you know what they say, and I'm not advising you to do this, by the way, but you know what they, some of them start doing? They stop giving. Because they know if the pastor doesn't get paid, eventually he has to go somewhere and make a living, so he goes elsewhere. Well, that just means that that pastor has another mission elsewhere, and God's going to use them, but I wouldn't want to be the congregation who robbed God in the process. So faithfully invest your money to accrue spiritual dividends. And in number three, as you come to Luke 16, and I'll close on this, and this is the bottom line, serve God and not materialism. The very last verse of 1 John says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. See, that's that same church at Ephesus that had Christ is a priority when they began the church. Because in the book of Ephesians, they had love for all the saints, which meant that they loved God. But then as you start to read in 1 Timothy, materialism started to creep in that same body of believers years later. 
And by the time you get to 1 John, maybe another decade or two comes and they're loving the world. And then you get to Revelation chapter 2, and it is so bad, Christ says, you've left your first love. Materialism, I think, crept in on their hearts, and he was threatening to close their church because they didn't keep him as a priority. So you serve God and not materialism, because verse 13 says, no man can serve two masters. And by the way, who's your master? Well, you see what you gave to the Lord's work. Evaluate that if you honored him as you should. And if not, then take a look at the rest of your income and see where your money's went. And there you will find your master. It's that simple. It's not a hard thing to do if you want to be honest about it. And I'll tell you something. Rather God hit you between the eyes if you have another master right now and let him deal with you because he's a wonderful God and we confess our sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is. He's wonderful like that. But don't presume upon him. Because remember in, in Luke 12, the rich man... And he has so much, and he, he doesn't know what to do with it all. Does he give it away? No. He says, I'm just going to go build another barn. I'm going to store up more for me, for me, for me. And that night, the voice comes from heaven and says, your soul's required of you now. Who then will own the things that you have stored up? Don't ever presume upon God. So no servant can serve two masters for either I hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And my dear friend, would you bow your head? Would you close your eyes?